Professor Rice? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, good morning. Yes. Perfect. Rice, good so I invite uh, Sarina to introduce you and start the lecture. All right. So I may start now, okay? Yep. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the sixth talk of Innovation in Linguistics by Cognitive Semantics. I'm Selina Liu, Editorial Assistant of Cognitive Semantics. Today, we're very honored to have Professor Stephen Grice with us. So good afternoon, Professor Grice. Um, it's great. Hello, good morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's great to see you again after your second 10 lectures talk in Beijing in 2018. So thank you for accepting our invitation and for supporting our journal. Uh, now, please allow me to introduce Professor Stephen Grice. Professor Stephen Grice is full professor of linguistics in the Department of Linguistics at the University of California, St. Barbara, as well as full professor as chair of English linguistics at Wooster's Leiby University of Gieson, Germany. So methodologically, Professor Grice is a quantitative corpus linguist at the intersection of corpus linguistics, cognitive linguistics, and computational linguistics. He uses statistical methods to investigate linguistic phenomena and the tests and the develops cross linguistics and the statistical methods. So theoretically, he is a cognitively oriented, usage-based based linguist. So Professor Bryce has published extensively in numerous leading peer-reviewed journals. And among his publications are 10 lectures on corpus linguistics with R, quantitative corpus linguistics with R, and statistics for linguistics with R, a practical introduction which has a Chinese translation, So both his textbooks and his research have inspired and influenced many researchers around the world to delve into the world of quantitative methods with R, so including me. Um, the title of his lecture today is Overhauling Colostructional Analysis from 2003 to 2018 to now. So Professor Gress, uh, I hand it over to you now. All right, thank you very much. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Let me uh, share my screen. Um, seconds. So I am hoping you see my screen now, is that correct? Yes, that's great. All right, perfect. So yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to <coughs> participate in this. Um, it's a great honor to be invited again after uh, the, the two times 10 lectures. It's good to be back. Uh, and uh, <coughs> I'm happy we could find a time. I know it's very early for you guys in the morning, but uh, I hope I can uh, I'll at least try to make it worth your while. All right, so as you can see, uh, the title of the talk, I've uh, tweaked uh, the subtitle a little bit. So it's still overhauling color structure and ana analysis. Uh, but now as with the paper uh, that goes with this talk, um, well, the subtitle is towards more descriptive simplicity or more explanatory adequacy. And theoretically, my, one might add a question mark to this. And so basically what I want to do is, uh, in, in a way, this is a talk that is a follow up on another talk and another paper um, a little bit more than three years ago uh, with some additional thoughts and um, ideas. So color structure analysis, uh, what is it? Um, it seems from the uptake that this method has enjoyed in the last 20 years, actually. Uh, it, uh, the first publication about this came out in 2003, uh, that this was one of our better ideas. Um, so what is it? It's one of the most widespread corpus linguistic methods to study constructions, essentially. Um, and uh, I would particularly like to emphasize already constructions here because this will be important in uh, two ways a little bit later. Uh, it's a family of three methods. Uh, the first one is called uh, colexeme analysis. And uh, what it's concerned with is basically how much typically uh, lemmas, often verbs, but it, don't, it doesn't have to be verbs, 
So how much lemmas like to occur in the slot of a typically more schematic construction? Um, in particular, there's been a lot of work on uh, sort of grammatical constructions having to do with tense or aspect or modality and argument structure constructions in the Goldbergian kind of sense, right? So the idea is to take a certain kind of, let's say, argument structure construction, uh, look at a specific grammatically defined slot in that construction and see which words like to go in there more than others and maybe which words don't like to go in there at all. Uh, the second uh, frequent method is distinctive colloxeme analysis, and it's kind of similar, also statistically similar. It's concerned with the question of how much, again, usually lemmas like to occur in slots of two or more functionally similar constructions. So in other words, um, this has been used a lot for the study of alternations. Uh, the most famous example, uh, uh, an alternation that has been analyzed to death uh, over the last 20 or 30 years would be the date of alternation. Right, so the difference between the ditransitive construction, uh, John gave Mary a book, and the prepositional dative construction, John gave a book to Mary. Right, so there the question would be, for instance, you know, if you look at the verb slot uh, here filled by the verb give in both of my examples, then you know which verbs like to occur in one construction as opposed to the other, and which verbs prefer the other construction. Right, so give is a verb that strongly likes the ditransitive construction. Um, other verbs like send, uh, you know, don't have such a strong preference. Um, of the three methods of construction analysis, those two are by far the most frequent. I, I wouldn't, I mean, I've, I haven't done a statistical study of this, you know, but I wouldn't be surprised if 90 to 95 percent of all studies doing anything construction-structural uh, do one of these two. Um, so this one here, I just mentioned it for the sake of completeness. Uh, this is the third member of this family called covariant colloxeme analysis. Um, and here the idea is to look at how much lemmas in one slot of a construction like to occur with other lemmas in another slot of the same construction. Okay, so for example, if you take um, uh, the first construction we looked at this, uh, with which we looked at this is uh, the intercausative. Okay, so that's a construction uh, to verb a direct object into verbing. Okay, to trick someone into believing, to bully someone into accepting. And so there, you know, the question might be, you know, if if the first verb is trick, you know, to trick someone into believing or whatever, then what are the verbs that occur in the second slot? Uh, and sometimes there's interesting correlations there. Now, how does one do that? Um, so first, one very quick sentence here before we look at this in more detail later. Uh, so most of these were computed from um, a statistical test that is called the Fisher-Yates exact test. Uh, it's a test that is not statistically not really related to a chi-square test, but it's a test that can often be used when a chi-square test is also an option. Um, and the two by two tables that one would look at this, uh, would look at for this, uh, look like this. Uh, so here's an example for a colloxeme analysis. Uh, I hope you can see my mouse pointer. Okay, so one would uh, look at a certain verb uh, for instance, give, um, which occurs a certain number of times in the corpus, namely A times in the ditransitive and B times anywhere else, right? So uh, a sentence like, you know, he gave her the book would be an example that is counted here. Uh, another example that would be something like, uh, you know, he gave, I mean, like a prepositional verb or something, he gave into her demands, uh, that would be something like uh, B. Okay, and then uh, the <clears throat> the uh, all the other verbs, apart from give, like send and tell and show and promise and deny and whatever, uh, for each of them, you would generate a two by two table like this. Um, and then on each of them, you compute a Fisher-Yates test or any other kind of statistical me me um, association measure actually. Um, and then you rank all of the verbs by, you know, which win, <laughs> you know, which have the highest scores, right? Um, for the distinctive colloxeme analysis, uh, this design changes, but really only a bit. Um, so here we have, again, a uh, two by two table for give, um, and it occurs a certain number of times, A times in the ditransitive, but uh, it also occurs B times in a competing functionally similar construction, right? Like the prepositional data. And so again, you do this for all the verbs that occur at least once in at least one of the two constructions, and then you rank them by preference uh, for the for which construction. 
And again, you can use Fisher Yates exact test, but also a lot of other different methods. Now, um, this has been done in a very large variety of contexts. Again, this has been one of the ideas that uh, back in the day, Anatol Stepanovich and I had that has had a lot of uptake. Uh, so it has been used in a very general corpus linguistic studies. Uh, it has been used in psycholinguistic applications and there's been especially recently a lot of work on uh, second foreign language acquisition or learning uh, in particular for instance with regard to questions like you know which uh, you know do non-native speakers of a language do they learn to acquire or whatever um, the same verb specific preferences of constructions that native speakers have right or is there a mismatch um, how does the mismatch disappear maybe over time as learners become more proficient and so on um, it has been used in diachronic studies of language change uh, to for instance monitor how different verbs are attracted to different functionally similar constructions over time um, <clears throat> if we have a longer scale historical data um, uh, Constructional results have been used in experimental studies, either as predictors of interest or as control variables. Uh, people looked at different registers, and it has been applied to a variety of languages. Um, I only list a few here. I'm pretty sure there's a ton more. Now, just for the record, uh, of course, the method has also been criticized. Um, in particular, there's, uh, I think, two papers uh, that have done this. Um, that are best known for doing this, basically, or two, two studies, so to speak. Uh, one is a chapter in Bybee's 2010, uh, 2010 uh, CUP book, um, which criticizes several aspects of the methods. Um, but I think I have been able to show in a studies and language paper in 2012 that many of those are based actually on misunderstandings of what the goals and methods are actually of color structure analysis. And then uh, a little bit more recently, um, in 2013, there was a paper by uh, Hans uh, by Hansjörg Schmidt and Herbert Kuzinov in, in 2013, who actually take up some of uh, by these misunderstandings and add a few others. Um, and in 2015, I wrote a cognitive linguistics paper that sort of addresses those. Uh, I don't want to discuss them here, these things here in more detail because that's not the focus of this talk. But obviously, if you uh, want to talk about these things, um, I, I can uh, you know discuss those in the Q and A. Now, what is the input to a traditional colexeme analysis or a traditional distinctive colexeme analysis? It's actually relatively simple, especially if, as many people have, you know, used my, my R script uh, that basically does pretty much uh, all of the statistical work for you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, typically the input for a colexeme analysis uh, looks like this. Okay, so we have a, a text file or a spreadsheet or whatever uh, that has all the words or lemmas that occur in a certain construction in the first column. Uh, in the second column, we have the frequencies of these words or lemmas in that construction. And in the third column, uh, typically, at least, we have the frequency of the, of the verb in the corpus. Okay, so here the red example would mean that the verb lemma ask occurs 92 times in the ditransitive and 428 times in the corpus altogether. Okay, so 90, basically this is another way of saying ask occurs 92 times in the ditransitive and then uh, 336 times in the corpus. And so then 92 and those 336, you know, make up the overall corpus uh, frequency of 428. Right, so um, what that means is then also uh, the frequency of the construction in the corpus is the sum of all these, right? Because here we list all verbs, uh, in this case, you know, verbs uh, in the construction, meaning here are all the frequencies of these verbs in the construction, meaning here where we only see a sample, you know, but the frequency of the ditransitive in the corpus is, whoops, uh, so this. Um, I don't know why it went back. I must have. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> is the uh, so the frequency of the construction is the sum total of um, uh, the second column, and then the corpus size is typically provided by the user, but it could actually also just be depending on how one does this, uh, the sum of this column. Right. Again, depending on how one does it, but 
in the past, it has been typical, typically the user who just provided that number by saying, you know, this is how big my corpus was. Now, here's one important thing to which we will return later. Uh, this includes no information on uh, where in the corpus uh, certain things occur, right? So for example, uh, the three instances here of the cord in the ditransitive, um, the input data as it has been traditionally used does not say whether this is one person who used a cord three times in the ditransitive and that's it, or whether that's three people, each of whom did this once, right? Used a cord in the ditransitive once. So we only have the sum total frequencies of things. We don't know uh, which speakers or which files contain things how often, uh, which will be important for later. <clears throat> now, then what is the usual way of doing this coaxium analysis? So we create, like I said, for every verb lemma, uh, a table like this. Uh, so here again, we're using ask and ditransitive. So the 92 and the 428, um, Okay, there's a slight problem here, but it doesn't matter right now. Uh, get entered here. We fill the remaining cells of the table. Um, and then <clears throat> the Fisher Yates exact test computes the probability that ask would occur in the ditransitive as often as it did or more often. Okay, again, there's a small uh, issue here, which I don't want to talk about now because it would just be confusing. But it, the point is basically one is asking given how often ask occurs, uh, you know, is it likely that it would occur in the ditransitive this often? And the response here would be that, well, it's actually extremely unlikely. Uh, that number gets log transformed, and then this would be the colexine value uh, that would be reported. And this is one of the highest that you would get. So ask has a very strong attraction to the ditransitive, right? So we do that for all lemmas, rank them, and then typically people look at the top 20, top 30, top 50 words, um, and you know, do whatever it is they want to do with those values to show something. Right. And then here's a bunch of other me measures that have been used. <clears throat> uh, Fisher Yates exact test has been the most frequent one, but people have also been using the likelihood, not likelihood ratio uh, and other statistics, many of which you know we don't need to concern ourselves with. So that's what's been done typically. So what, what do we want to do here today? Uh, so I want to make two sets of suggestions. Um, and they, uh, they have to do with two questions. Uh, namely, first, why do you actually do your analysis? So what's, what's the point of doing the cost colexeme analysis or the distinctive colexeme analysis? Um, and the two answers that I uh, want to distinguish here uh, for didactic reasons are these two. Uh, one might do such an analysis for descriptive or exploratory purposes. Um, and I think that's so far been the majority of cases. Um, or one might do it for theoretically informed or psycholinguistic reasons, which so far I think has been the minority. And the two suggestion sets basically apply to these different kinds of goals. Uh, so the first suggestion set um, is for the first type. Okay, it's for users who want to do a descriptive or exploratory analysis. Um, and in fact, the suggestions, uh, or the first main suggestion I will make um, amounts to a considerable simplification and also speed up of the analysis, uh, which has some corresponding benefits. And one way is it does this is that it actually doesn't use the, the most frequently used measure of attraction. Uh, but it suggests an alternative. Meaning instead of the Fisher Yates exact test, uh, we're going to use something that, are, that is called Pearson residuals. Um, and that is actually really, really simple. It's way simpler than pretty much anything else uh, that people have been using, in particular, you know, Fisher Yates and not likelihood. Um, and second, um, I, I will suggest that we use information about where in the corpus. Uh, the words occur in the construction, because this will allow us to do something that, as far as I can tell, no corpus, uh, no color structure analysis ever has done, namely provide a basically confidence intervals for our association measure. The second suggestion set is for the second type of goal, so for theoretical or psycholinguistic reasons. Uh, and here, it's going to be the opposite direction. It's going to be uh, making things a little bit more complex. 
uh, but with, I think, the corresponding benefits. So what we're going to do is we're going to add uh, dispersion uh, to the analysis. So the degree to which uses of something in a construction are evenly distributed across a corpus. Uh, we will do something that right now there's only this technical way to say this. Uh, we will orthogonalize frequency association and dispersion, meaning we're going to measure them in as different or unrelated ways as possible so that each of them contributes new information. And then third, um, and this will be a very minor case study, uh, we add uh, we add census to the analysis to address the notion of polysemy. Okay, so that's essentially the roadmap here. All right, <clears throat> so suggestion one, and I'm gonna exemplify this on the basis of a polyxeme analysis, uh, just because it's simplest, you know, but as you saw, you know, the distinctive polyxeme analysis mathematically is actually the same, it's the same two by two table. And so this one actually brings me way back because, you know, when I was many decades younger than I am now and naive, you know, uh, and when I learned about collocational measures in corpus linguistics, I actually never understood, and quite frankly, I'm still not quite sure why this is so, uh, I never understood why the association measures that people were computing in their collocational studies um, were based on these, you know, potentially thousands or tens of thousands of separate two by two tables, right? Just like we did earlier when we had this table of, you know, ask, uh, versus other things, and then the construction of interest versus the other constructions. And so we have this two by two table with the corpus frequencies. People did collocational studies like this. And for collocations, you know, in big corpora, this, this could mean constructing, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of two by two tables and con computing a separate log likelihood ratio or Fisher Yates exact test for every one of them. And, you know, 20, 25 years ago, when I looked at this, I never understood why people do it like that. I just didn't get it because I thought, why wouldn't one use the residuals of the chi-square test, uh, which was, you know, at the time, uh, one of the very few statistical things that I knew about. Um, now, what are those residuals? Uh, the answer is actually really simple. Um, like I said, I didn't lie when I promised that this is much simpler than something like Fisher Yates. Um, so, if you do a colostructional study. Uh, then you have these observed frequencies, right? And I rep I represent this here a little bit different now. Uh, so now I say, you know, uh, frequency. Uh, so this is now a table that says for every verb, how often it occurs in the construction of interest and elsewhere, right? So previously I said con uh, construction of interest and in the whole corpus. Now I'm saying, you know, construction of interest and the Every everything else. Okay, and this is where that issue that I'm ignoring now came up before, right? So this means you know a give occurs five sixty six times in the diatransitive, and it occurs six hundred and three times in other constructions. Okay, and make occurs three times in the diatransitive, and a ton of times elsewhere. Right? These are probably things like you know he made in a sandwich or something. Like that. Right? So we have these expected frequencies. And then, as if you wanted to compute a chi-square test, you compute the expected frequencies. Okay, which is, you know, in, in, I mean, even in Excel is very easy. In R, it's one line of code. Um, that's it. <clears throat> so we can see, for instance, that these eleven hundred something examples of give, um, if they were distributed by chance, they would they would look like this. There should be fifteen examples of give in the diatransitive and eleven hundred something elsewhere. But in fact, we have, five, I mean, uh, several dozen times as many instances of give in the diatransitive, right? So now we have for every verb construction co-occurrence, we have an, an observed value and an expected value, okay? And from those, we can compute the residuals and they're computed very simple, mainly just like this. You take the observed value, subtract the expected, and divide by the square root of the expected. Uh, of the expected. So, in other words, uh, again, I hope you can see the mouse. You know, you take five sixty six, subtract fifteen point five, so you get you know five fifty one, 
and then you divide 551 by the square root of this. So the square root of this is nearly four. So 551 divided by four, I mean, once you do the exact math, you know, it turns out to be this. Okay, and what I've done here is I've uh, marked the positive values in blue because that means the verb is attracted to the construction. And I've marked the negative values in red, which indicate that the verb doesn't like to occur in the construction, right? B never occurs in there. So the value is pretty strong and negative, right? And so back then, and to a certain extent, even now, I've never understood why don't we just do this? Because, you know, it's very simple. And uh, you might think now, again, just to make this very clear, this is not some something I came up with, you know, some deep dark magic that whatever. This is what one, if you ever have seen a chi-square test, that's basically what people were doing under the hood or what their software was doing, right? So we're just using something that's already been around for literally hundreds of years, uh, you know, for, uh, and, and use this for our purposes here, right? So if you, if you uh, square those and add them up, you get the chi-square test result for this paper. So it's very simple. Uh, and in the paper, you know, I show that this can be done in all of this can be done in a single line of code in R. Now, if you use this, how does it perform? Actually, it performs extremely well. Uh, it's only a single test rather than, you know, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands, which also means it's super fast, okay? If any one of you has used my R script and has had, you know, large uh, corpus data, uh, sometimes, you know, it takes a while. Uh, this one will pretty much always be instantaneous. You will never, ever have to wait more than a second for the result. And also, um, this is based on a statistical significance test, right, the chi-square test, but it actually doesn't compute a p-value. So for, for all those people who hate the idea that constructions or these kinds of things are based on p-values from significance testing, well, this isn't. At the same time, uh, for ditransitives in the ISGB corpus, the rank correlation of these results with Fisher Yates exact, so the very, very labor intensive and sometimes very slow test is 0.99, and for the log likelihood value it's 0.994. So we have something here that, you know, is pretty much exactly what the previous results have returned, but it's it can be you know hundreds of times faster, and that has a very important uh, consequence for later. Uh, so here, just to show you very briefly, uh, so here I've computed a variety of measures on uh, the ditransitives in the um, ISGB, uh, you know, their frequency, the log frequency, the traditional Fisher Yates value log likelihood, and so on. And here's the new one, the chi-squared residuals. And these are the two values I just mentioned. So they're, they're very, very highly correlated with the two measures that most people have preferred in the past. Although again, they're way, way faster. There's another big advantage of doing this. Um, and that is that the same method can be applied to the distinctive colexeme analysis. And even what hasn't been able, what hasn't been possible in the past, a multiple distinctive color sequences. So let's very quickly look at those. Um, so uh, let's look at uh, transitive phrasal verbs um, in a distinctive color scheme analysis. So transitive phrasal verbs are verb particle constructions, right? So things like to pick up a book versus pick a book up, to carry out an instruction, to carry an instruction out, things like this, or to carry out the trash, carry the trash out, uh, things like that. And it's completely the same, there's no difference. Uh, so again, you have observed frequencies of these phrasal verbs in one construction now versus the other, right? So you can see the verb carry out occurs a single time in a construction where you have the verb and the object of the particle. So carry the trash out or something like this. And it occurs 49 times in the other construction, carry out an instruction or something like that. And then again, you can compute the expected frequencies. Um, you compute the residuals. And I mean, it's all the same. There's literally no difference uh, between the two. <clears throat> and again, it performs uh, super well because it is just one very fast test. <clears throat> and it is um, 
very, very highly correlated with the results from the traditional test. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the traditional test results can be nearly 100% predicted from the chi-squared residuals with the right kind of statistical model. So, you know, works really well. Um, but again, the big advantage is that this now also works if we have more than two constructions, right? So for example, uh, you can do this. Uh, previously, you know, you could use this approach to compare the will future versus the going to future because it's two constructions and you could do a fishing rates exact test, blah, blah, blah. What you could not do anymore is apply the same statistical method to cases where you had more than two alternatives. So for example, if you were looking at um, future tense or, or future tense reference, uh, I just reviewed the paper on this yesterday, um, you know, will versus going to versus shell, then we have three alternatives, not just two. And the whole Fisher-Yates logic um, essentially breaks down. Um, and it, one had to do something else. And in fact, the thing that one had to do uh, or the, the thing that I implemented in my script it was pretty pretty much a pain in the ass. It was terrible. I mean, it it was statistically meaningful, you know, but it was it was awfully complicated. And here now, the good news is it's the same thing. Uh, so let me show you. So that if we take going to versus will versus shell. Uh, then it's the same thing. You know, again, we have the observed frequencies of every verb with each of the future tenses, for lack of a better term, right? So say here occurred uh, 42 times after going to, three times after shall, and 10 times after will, right? So the only difference is we now have three columns because we have three constructions, but that's it. So we can compute the expected frequencies and we can compute the residuals just like before. And now the only difference is uh, that a verb can be attracted to more than one construction. But typically uh, there will be a big difference between the strength of these attractions. So for example, you can see here that the verb say actually likes going to and shall, and this prefers will. Okay, so people in these data, you know, in this corpus people were less likely to say, I'll say, they were more likely to, to say, I'm going to say, right? And then they were, they were a little bit more likely to say, I shall say. But you can see uh, that obviously the results clearly say, okay, say likes going to futures and shall, but it really likes going to futures way more than shall, right? But again, it's super fast, um, way faster than the old uh, method that I had to program in order to, for people to be able to do this. Um, we, we can't compare these results exactly to the original results from 2004 because there we didn't do a multiple distinctive collect seam analysis. Uh, but the the top verbs here for going to, for instance, are uh, that they reported are in the same uh, top 10 group for verbs here as well. So there is a relatively strong overlap between the two. Okay, so <clears throat> what do we uh, conclude here um, in the interim? So the chi-squared residuals uh, seems like a really good alternative. It returns results that are extremely highly correlated with what people have preferred to do so far, right? Um, at the same time, uh, the, this approach, the chi-squared residuals requires little to no expertise. If you have the input in the right format, you know, this table of uh, frequencies, you literally need one or two lines of code. Now that's a dual-edged sword because I <laughs> have made a career out of saying, you know, people should have not just a little or no expertise, they should have some statistical expertise, uh, but still, you know, in general, of course, it is nice that the method here is so, so simple and so, so fast uh, that it can be really adopted even more widely than what we've seen so far. Uh, the results are available instantaneously. Um, also, um, I can't, I can't, I should have counted, you know, I can't recall how many mails I've received from people uh, who had large corpora uh, in their analysis and they ran my script. And then because of how R deals with very high and very low numbers, um, their Fisher-Yates exact results were often infinite, infinity. 
meaning they might have had five or six or 10 verbs uh, that all scored the same collocational strength score of infinity, and they couldn't distinguish between them anymore. And so people then wrote to me, what do I do? Uh, so I, uh, I wrote, I mean, I had advice for them, you know, but with the current approach, actually, this cannot happen. Uh, so that problem is solved automatically. And the speed thing is actually not just, you know, like I say here, a trivial time saver. It's not just, you know, oh, computation needs more element, you know, what, but what do we care? You know, we're not computer scientists. We're not getting a prize if our script is a little faster. Uh, yes, that's true. But um, it means we can now do something because it's so fast uh, that has not traditionally been done. And that is we can quantify the uncertainty of our color structural results in ways uh, that you know so far haven't existed. And you can do this with uh, bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is a method, um, a statistical, gener a very general statistical approach that is based on randomly resampling from the data that you have. Okay, so the idea is you have a, uh, just abstractly speaking, you have a certain data set, uh, you compute a certain statistic on it, let's say an average, a mean, okay, or a median or whatever. Um, and then you think, okay, but I only have a sample here. Uh, so how, how reliable, how uncertain is this sample that I computed? Because the next person who will collect the corpus, you know, their results will be different. And I want to be able to say, well, how different are they going to be? And so what you do is you take a random sample. So you take your data set. Uh, I'm gesturing here for those who look at that. Uh, so you take your data set and take a random sample of it with resampling and compute your measure again. And then you do that again. And then you do that again. So maybe you, know, you, you have your data and you take a thousand random samples with replacement from it compute the same statistic a thousand times, and then you can compute a confidence interval from this in a way that is actually very simple. But there's one important question one needs to answer first, and that is how to do the random sampling. So uh, gesturing again, you know, if this is your data set, there are minimally two ways you can do this. One would be every example in your corpus you know, every use of a verb in the ditransitive or whatever has the same probability of being selected because it's completely random, you know, across all the examples. The other example uh, or the other approach would be to say, <clears throat> okay, this is my corpus with all the ditransitive examples in there. It consists of multiple files. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to sample on the basis of every verb. I'm going to sample on the basis of every speaker or every document. Okay, and the latter using documents or speakers for sampling is the right way to go. <laughs> Why? So <clears throat> we want to quantify uncertainty because our corpus is typically a sample of the language, right? No, there's no English corpus that you know covers all of English. There's no Mandarin Chinese corpus that covers all of Mandarin Chinese. We always just have a sample. But that means we need to quantify whatever we compute for our sample, for our corpus, how likely, uh, I mean, how reliable, or, you know, with what kind of uncertainty does that statistic come once you say, okay, I have a corpus of English, you know, I computed a certain result there, but now, you know, I want to generalize to all of English or all of English of that time period or all of English from that register. So you might say, uh, especially if you know a little bit of statistics, you might say, yeah, but you know, we don't need to worry about this because um, we can just compute our association measure, let's say the fissure age test or an odds ratio, and statistical package give us a confidence interval for that. So we just use that. But, you know, or you might say, you know, <clears throat> okay, we do a bootstrap on the basis of the data points. So we let uh, we let an algorithm just randomly pick this verb, that verb, that verb, that verb, compute our stuff, you know, do that again, and so on. But the answer is no. You cannot do either of those two. The results will be wrong. Why is that? Um, <clears throat> so this is the technical response. Uh, so um, 
basically the, the confidence interval that a statistics program will output or the bootstrapping based on picking individual verbs, they are based on an assumption that is that every corpus linguist knows is wrong. Um, they basically uh, rely or are based on the assumption uh, or in a model that is called the bag of the words model. Okay, the idea being that a corpus it's just a big it's just a big bag filled with all the words in there and you just pick something randomly out but but the problem is that corpora don't behave like that right corpora are comp uh, contain data that have been contributed by speakers or by writers in conversations or in you know articles or something like this articles have topics and so you know if you uh, if you pick a, a word out of a corpus then all the other words in that corpus from the same file, you know, will, will be more similar to the verb that you pick randomly than any other, right? Simply because there will be topic preferences, there will be individual speaker preferences and so on. <clears throat> so, you know, we can't do this. We have to do something else. So how could we do this? Um, we need a little bit of different input for this. Uh, because now we need information about where something occurs in the corpus. Okay, so <laughs> instead of either of these two, which is what we used before, right? Ask occurs this much in the ditransitive, this often elsewhere, or you know, ask occurs again this much in the ditransitive and this much altogether in the corpus. This doesn't say where ask occurs, right? Instead of this. We need something like this. So now the input has three columns. The first one uh, here, I'm using files from the ISGB. The first one is the file in which a verb occurs. The second is the verb lemma. And the third is, is it the construction of interest? So here uh, in this, you know, obviously super, super small sample, uh, the first verb in this file is the verb tell. And it is actually used in a ditransitive. And the second verb in the same corpus file is B, and that's not used in a ditransitive, and so on. And then the next for the next file. In this, in the second file, graduate is used, but not in the ditransitive. In the same file, give is used, and here it is used ditransitively. Right? So now we don't just have for every word whether it occurs in a ditransitive or not, but also where. <clears throat> right? So that's what I just said. And so now we can do a bootstrapping approach uh, on the basis of, you know, the files, meaning we don't pick randomly, let's say, uh, this word here for tell. Uh, we pick the whole file so that whatever happens in that complete file or, you know, whatever that speaker has written, it, it's chosen all together. And then how does it work? Well, we might do something like this. A thousand times, and that's why speed is good, <laughs> uh, we sample from all the 500 files, 500 with replacement. We compute our color structural measure and collect them and plot them. Okay, and the result then looks like this, or can look like this. Uh, so these are the results for the British component of the International Corpus of English. So we see uh, that tell and give are the by far most strongly attracted verbs to the transitive. And actually they don't, they're not significantly different. They overlap, right? But they're very, very different from everything else. So tell and give are the prototypical verbs for the ditransitive. And at least for give, everybody likes that. Uh, this one's interesting because it shows that tell might do even better. Uh, and then all the other verbs are below that, and some of them are actually not significantly attracted, even though their semantics fit really well. So for accord here, you can see that the confidence interval overlaps with zero. Uh, same for, uh, where was it again, assigned here. Okay, and that's really nice because uh, probably the second most frequent question that I received from people who used my script or something else is, okay, but where do we stop? you know, which words do we include, which are significant, blah, blah, blah. And the answer to that has always been very, very tricky 
Now it's not anymore. Now we can just say, well, we include everything uh, that is significant. And there's 88 verbs in the ditransitive in this corpus. Uh, 54 are significant, 34 are not. And we can just get this uh, from looking at this display and see, okay, which confidence intervals include zero, those we are not going to interpret. Same thing uh, works for the distinctive colloxene analysis. So here are the corresponding results for the verbs that like verb particle object, carry out, find out, and so on. And here I just give the first 15 or 20 or something like this. So we don't even see cases that are not significant. And here are the verbs that are significantly attracted to verb object particle. Okay, so get something back, get something out, play something back, turn the lights off, something like that, right? Whereas these ones here prefer verb particle object, carry out some instructions, find out the solution, point out the problem, you know, stuff like that. Now, I want to give you guys 10 seconds to think about something. So look at this result here, the top right, okay? And look at the top distinctive collexine for VPO, carry out, okay? So just, you know, five to 10 seconds, just think about, okay, what would I say there in terms of interpretation? Uh, why might this be attracted to this? Uh, how would I interpret this semantically? Okay, just think about it for a second. And the way I've actually talked about this has already given you a little bit of a clue. But um, yeah, just take a moment. All right. So, so this was suggestion step one. So basically use piercing residuals because it's super fast. And then because it's so fast and so prob problem free, uh, maybe consider doing something like this uh, to see whether um, whether verbs are significantly attracted to something or not. Now, suggestion set two uh, picks up on some ideas that I first formulated in 2019, and that again I've um, I've been trying to refine a little bit over the last few years. And the motivation for this approach is that. The simplification approach for descriptive or exploratory applications that I've just talked about uh, isn't good enough for theoretical or psycholinguistic work. Okay, for that, we need something better. Why? Uh, because we're still losing a lot of information or using very little information. And to just make that clear, with the, uh, I want to use a little thought experiment. Okay, <clears throat> imagine the following situation. Imagine you actually know nothing about corpus-based association measures, okay? You don't know anything about whatever, mutual information, Fisher gates, peers and residuals, you know, you don't know anything about this. Uh, but, you know, you work in a data science company or at Google or something, you know, and you're asked, uh, because you're a linguist, you know, you're asked to develop the ideal association measure approach for word construction associations, uh, especially with cognitive or, you know, psycholinguistic goals and for whatever fancy search or whatever mechanism that the search engine or something like that might have in mind, right? So basically you're tasked to develop something like color structures, but you don't know anything yet about statistical measures for this. So you kind of have to develop it from scratch. The thought experiment now is this, what dimensions of information would you think are relevant for this? Okay, <clears throat> some are easy, uh, others maybe not so much. Uh, one that's easy is frequency, right? Of course, you know, especially if you have a little bit of corpus linguistic knowledge, you know that, you know, frequency is important, uh, especially from a cognitive or psycholinguistic perspective, right? And here's one quote uh, that I've used a lot of times simply because it's a very good quote um, that makes that point, you know? So whatever you develop, uh, frequency should be a part of it. Second, well, you're tasked to uh, develop an association measure. So of course, you know, you know, you you want to include association in there, right? And again, I'm including a little quote here by Nick Ellis. Um, 
or two, in fact, uh, the, the most important one here is human, in, human learning is to all intents and purposes perfectly calibrated with normative statistical measures of continuity, like chi-squared, like Pierce's R, and so on. Right, so whatever you develop, it needs to include frequency and it needs to include association in some way. <clears throat> and actually our association measures so far, like Pearson Museums, they do that, but they do that in a way that we will see is problematic in the moment. But what else? Well, dispersion might be relevant. Again, dispersion being, you know, how evenly or unevenly are things distributed across a corpus. Why is that important? Because it basically moderates or complements or even replaces effects of frequency, right? Uh, again, a nice quote here by, uh, and from a language acquisition study, given a certain number of exposures to a stimulus or a certain amount of training, which means, you know, given a certain frequency, learning is always better when exposures or training trials are distributed over several sessions. This finding is extremely robust in many domains of human cognition. Right, so it's clearly something that cognitively or psycholinguistically, you know, is relevant, and we have tons of evidence for that. Right, and then there are other things one might consider, which I'm not going to talk about now. So we need multiple dimensions of information, but they need to be orthogonal. Uh, orthogonal meaning they need to be measured independently of each other, and. This is where traditional work runs into a problem. Because how do we measure these dimensions, frequency, association, and dispersion? Well, frequency is easy. You know, we just count and then often we log, you know, whatever. Fine. Association is much trickier already. Because many association measures, in particular those based on p-values, like Fisher Yates, like log likelihood, and actually also like Pearson residuals, they are extremely strongly correlated with frequency, and actually more so than with association. Okay, uh, so in a paper that came out a few months ago, I showed that maybe the most frequently used association measure in all of corpus linguistics, the log likelihood value, is extremely correlated with frequency, but much less with association. In other words, uh, what the field has been doing is this. We take frequency, we transform it ever so slightly into something else, and then we call it, oh, and now it measures association. Um, although, again, in that paper, I show it actually doesn't. Uh, so uh, we need, uh, here's, a, here's one example that shows this very clearly from mm -hmm. that other paper. So uh, in the left panel, uh, so here I'm looking at um, adjective noun collocations. Okay, every, every point here is an adjective noun collocation. And so on the x-axis, you have the logged frequency, on the y-axis, you have the log likelihood value, and you can see it's nearly perfectly correlated. But the same collocation, uh, collocations, uh, the log likelihood scores are pretty much not at all correlated with association strength, namely the log odds ratio. Forget about this one, right? So what we need to do is we need to make sure that if we measure association, we measure it in a way that doesn't just duplicate frequency because we're already doing that here separately. We need to measure it in a way that adds something. Now, it's, the, it's even worse for dispersion. Um, in a paper that's, uh, that just came out, I think a few weeks ago, um, a sister publication to this one, um, I show that most dispersion measures are 0.8 or higher correlated with frequency. So we have the same problem. Uh, here's an example. Uh, so for, uh, I think, 50,000 words, we have their frequency on the x-axis and their dispersion on the y-axis. And again, you can see there's a, an extremely high correlation between the two. If you know the frequency, you can predict, uh, you know, 92% of the variance of the dispersion values. Right, so that's not helping because again, uh, we're taking frequency, we're, we're messing around with it a little bit, and then we say, oh, and now it measures dispersion, uh, but it doesn't. It still measures frequency quite a bit. What we need is a dispersion measure that is not, by definition, correlated with frequency. And in that paper, I developed one, and 
you know, I'm happy to talk about this uh, more in the Q and A. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with this now. Um, uh, I'm going to skip this here. So let's apply this to the ditransitive construction. Um, and for that, uh, I'm going to show you this one here. Uh, so this is the result uh, of applying this. Uh, and so here we have a three-dimensional cube because we measure three things, right? Here at the top, you can see the frequency, uh, which is logged. Okay, so verbs that are at the front here are rare in the ditransitive. Verbs that are at the end here um, are uh, frequent in the ditransitive. And we can see that tell and give are the most frequent ones in the ditransitive. Okay, give a tiny little bit more frequent than tell. Now, on this axis here, we have the log odds ratio. This is an association measure that doesn't just replicate frequency. Okay, it measures association pretty much independently of frequency. And here it's interesting because you can see that um, that there's there's actually a variety of words that are more strongly associated with the ditransitive than give, right? Like convince, tell, assure, uh, pay, and whatever that other one is. I can't read it right now. Uh, we'll see a different representation in a second. Right, and then we have dispersion on this axis here at the front. Okay, mm -hmm. so the further to the left, the more evenly distributed something is in the corpus, uh, but in a way measured that isn't affected by frequency. And so that now we can see give actually wins over tell and convince and assure and the others. Okay, so, so the advantage now is we can see, uh, you know, we can see not only how frequent is something in the ditransitive maybe compared to expected, and now we see how frequent is it, how strongly associated is it, how evenly dispersed is it. And those are the those are three dimensions that much of cognitive linguistics, much of usage-based linguistics, that, and people always admit that this is important, uh, but they never measure it. This does measure it, right? If you look at, and it's important for language acquisition, because obviously, you know, if you see something a certain number of times, then, you know, you learn it better if it's not all on the same day, but if it's spaced out. Um, obviously, for language change, you know, massing something into a short time period versus over longer periods, uh, it's important there. Uh, and again, now we can just see it and we can make very good comparisons between what's going on. Uh, same thing now uh, for the uh, way construction. One. Okay, it looks like this. So the most frequent word in the way construction is make, or the most frequent lemon, right? You make your way to the top, you make your way through the crowd, uh, and things like this. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of association, uh, there's actually words, a lot of words that are more strongly attracted to the construction. Find, uh, fight, push, um, uh, and then all these words here, you know, like smash, grope, wind, wheedle, chomp, blush. I mean, all of them are higher up in the plot. All these verbs are actually more strongly attracted to the way construction. And even in terms of dispersion, you know, make is very frequent, but it's not that well dispersed given its frequency. Even things like you know force, work, find, fight, or come, uh, you know, are uh, more strongly attracted, uh, more, are more evenly dispersed in the way construction. So again, as soon as your issue or your interest has anything to do with learnability, either in the first or in a second language acquisition context, you know, you do need to know not just frequency, but also association and dispersion, you know, how likely are students to see this word actually in the course. Uh, for the way construction is actually interesting. Uh, let me just uh, skip through that here. Plot. Uh, because, you know, we have words that score high on all three dimensions. Then we have a ton of words that have, I, I wrote a separate paper just about that. 
uh, we have many words that have an alliteration effect. So they also start with the with sound, just like the word way. And then we have brute force words, and we have a bunch of you know biting or something like that, verbs that are often used in that construction. So quite some interesting semantic groupings. Okay, but again, the main point is we now can see, uh, you know, what is how, how and or why certain words play a strong role for a certain construction. For some, it will be their frequency. For some, it will be their association, and yet for others, it will be their um, dispersion. All right, um, <clears throat> coming to the end, a uh, very small case study. Uh, this is a, just a different representation of the same thoughts. Um, uh, <clears throat> so the, the subtitle of this very short part here is, you know, we always say colostructions, but. So what do I mean by that? Um, Tupelization so far meant including more orthogonal distributional information, right? I compute association in a way that is not overly determined by frequency, compute dispersion in a way that is not overly determined by frequency, and so on. And we do need to do that, okay? But there's another thing we need to do, and that is we should actually constantly remind ourselves, and that includes some of my own past work, um, uh, what the method actually is about, okay? It's called colostruction which implies construction, okay? And the whole method came out of a construction grammar kind of approach a la Goldberg and so on. And what is a construction? Well, it's a pairing of form and function, right? No big news there. But, but are we always doing that? And here the sobering answer is no, we're not. Why not? Because usually one of the items in a colostructional study involves a sort of proper maybe sort of more abstract, more grammatical argument structure construction, right? They have ditransitives or prepositional datives or way construction or phrasal verbs or, you know, future, future reference or something like that. Okay, so those are constructions in the construction grammar sense of the term because they have a certain form as defined, you know, by like the NPNP or something like that. And they have a certain function. For instance, the transfer meaning of the ditransitive construction the future meaning, you know, of the real future. Okay, so fine. But the other one, a lot of times is just reduced to its formal side, meaning the character strings, without taking the functional side or the semantic side into consideration enough. But that means we're actually not treating this properly as a construction, but just as, in, as some character strings, letters. Okay, and so here's, why I, and, and this is why I wanted you to think about carry out for a moment when we looked at verb particle object. What construction is that carry out? Well, actually it could be two uh, because carry out is just letters, okay? If you think about it as a construction, you need to add the semantics to it. And so then one construction is the letters carry out and the semantic, I mean, the meaning of execute. And, you know, and that's what you use if you say, you know, he carried out the orders or something like that. But of course, there's also, you know, carry out with the sense of move outside, carry out the luggage or carry out the garbage, right? But if you just talk about carry out, you're actually not staying true to the nature of a construction because carry out doesn't tell you, okay, what's the functional pole of this? What's, uh, to use Lanaka terms, you know, the, the semantic pole, is it execute? or the sense move outside, right? So unless we address this in some way, we're not doing color structures. And here's another example for this. Um, consider something like, um, you know, put down. Um, this can mean kill, you know, I had the dog put down. It can mean place, I put down the coffee cup. It can mean write or register. Right, so, oh, it's a potluck, put me down for some pudding, right? So register that I will bring pudding to this dinner or something. It can mean denigrate, uh, right? Or comment on negatively. Must you put him down like that? He's only starting to learn this. That's why he's not good at it yet. Um, and then there's even more idiomatic uses like insist, you know, put some, I mean, put your foot down, right? All of these things, those are different constructions. They all have the same form put down, 
but they have different semantic poles, right? And so they're different constructions. One needs to distinguish them, but a lot of time, most of the time, people just went with, okay, put down. And then they probably went with the prototypical or the most literal one, like put down the coffee cup. But of course, all these other senses are also tested. And this really has been used only in, in a very small number of studies. And in the paper, I summarize what they do. I don't want to do this now for lack of time. So let's do a very, very small case study here just to highlight the importance of this. Uh, so let's look at two phrasal verbs that actually in the analysis before didn't have a strong preference for either of the two orders, right? Verb particle, object, verb object particle. Put down has all these senses up here. Pick up has these senses. <clears throat> okay, it has the sense of register or notice. You know, I picked up, uh, you know, I, I did pick up this problem in the analysis. You know, obviously it can mean something like take, you know, we picked up the coffee cup. Uh, it could mean something like meet romantically or, you know, sexual conquest. You know, like he's always picking up women left and right or something like that. So, you know, pick up has a variety of senses as well. And then we're looking at carry out, which has the two senses of execute and move. And one clearly finds very quickly that polysemy makes a big difference. So for carry out, all the 49 senses uh, uses of execute were in this construction. And the one other use in the other construction was the different one of move. So basically, we we have a hundred percent perfect separation of the two senses and the two construct uh, and the two word orders in the two constructions. For pickup, uh, we have a group of senses that prefer this order: verb, object, particle. Uh, right. So to um, meet romantically, you know, pick women up, but address or something like that. I picked up the problem in the in the analysis that prefers the other construction. And for put down, the interesting thing was that put down in the previous analysis, which didn't look at polysemy, actually said, you know, there's no there's no preference. It can go either way, you know, with either of the two verb particle constructions. But that's not true. So once we distinguish uh, the six different senses here, and one is actually I didn't know what that was. It was unclassifiable even from the context. Uh, but we can see that you know some prefer the one construction in some senses prefer the other construction. And then this one is unclassifiable. So uh, we should actually never, you know, just go with the letter sequence put down. We should always assign the sense to it, which of course is very difficult um, before we do our color selection analysis, especially again, if we're talking about something that's supposed to be cognitive or psycholinguistically real. Because, you know, a cognitive linguistic analysis or construction ground analysis would always say, well, of course, you need to look at the semantic pole of the construction. All right. So last slide, uh, which is basically just the summary, you know, the take home message here, which is essentially a decision tree. So if your goal is really only descriptive or exploratory, uh, and you, you see that I say really, you know, because by now the method has been around 20 years you know, are we still doing just descriptive exploratory stuff? You know, we're still fussing around with, okay, what does this actually do? Uh, I think it's time to, to say, you know what, we're not just describing and exploring anymore. By now, you know, we can use this in a proper hypothesizing uh, kind of way. But, you know, if for whatever reason, you know, who am I to tell you what to do? Um, if you go really, really, really is only descriptive and exploratory, you know, then, Okay, combine frequency and association if you must, you know, and use, for instance, Pearson residuals or something because it's so much faster and so much more elegant and disregard dispersion. But you should quantify your uncertainty because you're disregarding all the other information that one should actually consider. So at least you should make sure that you cover your basis by saying, you know, okay, I disregard dispersion and all sorts of other things, you know, but it, but you know, because I know these things are important, let me at least quantify, okay, this is how much uncertainty comes with my results. Right. <clears throat> and of course, you should consider distinguishing senses so that you actually do real color structures kind of stuff. Now, if your goal is theoretical or explanatory, then I think you do have to use at least frequency association and dispersion. Uh, and you have to do so in an, in an orthogonalized way. 
meaning your association measure must not just replicate frequency. Your dispersion measure must not just replicate frequency. Uh, you know, this needs to be done differently, and I'm happy to talk about how this can be done and or point you to the publications where I do this. And of course, if your goal is theoretically or explanatory, then you have to distinguish different senses. You know, then you have no excuse to say, oh, I'm just going to treat it all the same, you know, because then your theoretical approach and cognitive or psycholinguistics will just be wrong. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> and I'm happy to have questions, comments, impressions, and whatever you might have. Okay, great. Thank you, Professor Grace, for this very brilliant talk. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind after listening to your lecture is that Professor Grass hardly ever disappoints. So your updates in co-structural analysis, which combines the two different approaches, one is if we want to do uh, the descriptive simplicity type of research, and the other is if we want to do explanatory adequacy type of research, and your discussion on polysemy, are very innovative and refreshing. So before we get to the Q&A session, so uh, Thomas, would you like to add some comments? Yeah. Um, uh, hi, uh, Stephen. Thank you very much for your most up to date for the Colos uh, structural analysis. Why I introduce my team, you can take a breath. Uh, the, the whole team working for your talk this morning, and some of them are behind the curtain. And uh, hi, Ayaman, are you here? Hello, Yaman. She's, uh, you know, restreaming your talk in another Chinese software we call uh, Tencent. Oh, I see. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and, and she's still she reports, you know, the audience on the, in the, you know, the room. Uh, is there any uh, internet problem? Uh, can you hear Mama? Hi, Mama. You didn't unmute yourself, I guess. Heck. Uh, hi. Can you hear my voice now? Yes. yes. Uh, okay. Hi, Grace. Uh, I'm Yamo, and I'm chairing the other channel, uh, the Tencent meeting to relay this lecture, um, and uh, and we have another almost two hundred audience. Uh, use, oh, use, <laughs> use the and meeting to uh well, to watching your lecture, and I have transferred some some questions in the chatting room. You may check them from the oh the I see okay audience. yes yes let me let me do that one second okay I'll just um clean up my desktop here and uh, ah yes I see okay all right let me see um. Okay, so the first question, um, I don't know whether every, probably not everyone can see them, right? If it's coming from different, so let me just read it uh, so that everybody knows uh, which one I'm talking about. Uh, so can uh, color structure analysis deal with clauses? I mean, when the input lemmas or variables are clauses instead of one or two words, can you still make use of that? For example, current covariant analysis uh, can only input words no more than three lemmas. I was wondering how I how can I still count on the comma analysis when the variables become two clauses, six even three words? Well, um, so it's tricky. Uh, I mean, there's there's two answers there basically. So one very simple one is uh, yes, it can uh, because you know it, it's just a matter of formatting the input the right way. Right, so if you, uh, I mean, if the if the columns for that contains usually words, you know, now contain multiple words or clauses. If you just make it clear to the software that okay, this is like multiple Chinese words, but treat them as one unit, you know, then of course the rest of the analysis will will follow, you know, in with no problem, right? So so in a very simple sense, the answer is yes, uh, you can do that. Um, however, the uh, so depending on the language you're looking at, um, the the data may require some, let's say, pre-processing. Okay, 
So uh, what I mean by this is the following. So imagine you, uh, I mean, so I don't know what language you're looking at, you know, but imagine you're looking at a language that has a, a very complex uh, morphology, right? So then that means uh, that you might have very, very, very many different tokens, um, but they actually correspond to relatively few levels, right? So for example, um, so Russian, for instance, has a has a very lively morphology, you know. So for many, uh, so verbs can have multiple different forms. Uh, there's actually different uh, verb stems depending on the aspect, and then potentially also on the kind of movement, right? So something, uh, so something like go, you know, in Russia, in Russian could be considered two or actually four verbs, you know, uh, and then potentially prefixed two more, and they all have different verb forms. Right. And so obviously, if you just take the if you use such a language and then you have multiple different forms, all of, you know, different forms of go, but in all these different morphological combinations, you will run into statistical problems. Right. Because you just have very, very low frequencies uh, of things unless you lemmatize. Right. So for something like this, then lemmatization on the clause level. Uh, would be very important because otherwise, even if technically speaking, you can run the script, you're not going to love the results very much because they're going to suffer from that. So, so that's basically the answer. So yes, it can theoretically be done, but it might require more preparation for the input. Okay, so uh, the next question, uh, I'm not going to pronounce the names, okay, because they can just go wrong, and some of them are even in character. So. Uh, so, could you please tell me why the observed minus the expected has to be divided by the square root of the expected? Is there any statistical mechanism behind it, like the t-test? Uh, yes, the statistical mechanism behind it is the logic of the chi-square test. So, um, let me just go back to that slide and show that again one more time. Okay. So, um, okay, here it is, and then. Um, oops, share screen. Right, so um, like I said, for this slide, uh, let's pretend for a second, just for ease of talking about this, you know, that this is actually every, all there is. You know, there is no additional things down here. There's really just five verbs only in the ditransitive and nothing else. Okay, so. Uh, then you compute the expected frequencies like this. And then, like I said, you know, you compute observed minus expected, and then divide this by the square root of expected. And the reason why you do that is, um, and how it relates to the chi-square test is the next two lines here on the left, you know, as you will see in a moment, uh, or three, uh, you know, because, so if you take, if you take each of these residuals and you square them, then you get something that is called, that in statistics is called the contribution to chi squared. Okay. And squaring residuals is something you know, perhaps, uh, you know, I don't know your statistical expertise, uh, you know, from other contexts. Uh, for instance, residual, like in regression modeling, residuals are squared. You know, same here. So we do something that is, uh, that is used in other statistical contexts too. And the reason for squaring them or one reason for squaring them is so that the minuses go away and these values become positive. So that all together, you know, the values add up to a positive number. And then the, the ultimate connection to the chi-square test is that if you take the squared values, right? So you take this value 10.34 and square it, you know, so it's gonna be like 102 or something like this. You take this value of minus 20 point something and you square it, so it becomes 400 and something. And so, and you do that for all these cells, right? This one becomes squared, so it becomes 0.25, whatever, right? And so, and then when you add all those up, that's the chi-square test value, okay? If you run a chi-square test on this table, you will get exactly the result of, you know, you do this, divide by that, square, sum up, that's gonna be the chi-square test value. So, so that's the reason for doing that. So the relationship is, is one like in a classical test, uh, like you ask about, you know, just not the t-test, but the chi-square test. But that's where that logic is coming from. And I talk a little bit about it in my book um, in the section on the chi-square test. Okay, um, there's a question 
pretty much explicitly in China, uh, exclusively in Chinese. So I'm not gonna talk about that. Mm -hmm. We can um, ignore it. Yeah, it's not a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Okay. So uh, next question. Just now, I saw you show an example of color structural analysis on future constructions, and you showed the frequency of will shall and going to. Then about the future. Uh, how then? How about the future present? How about present progressive and future users? Can we still use color analysis three point two to do it? Um, yes, you can. Uh, so if you have um, additional. Uh, so if you include simple present uh, with say uh, future adverbs, you know, or present progressive or something like this. Um, so you have not three, but five uh, different uh, future word expression um, constructions, so to speak, uh, you can still use the old color structure script, um, but I would actually recommend you use the new one because it's gonna make it simpler and faster. Uh, and actually the results will be uh, the, the numerical results will be interpretable on the same scale as if you only had two. So, so the short answer is yes, but I would still recommend using the new script uh, because it's going to give you um, results that are more easily comparable to other things. Actually, I noticed that oh. the latest version of color analysis is 4.0 version. So, um, the participants That's make correct. the yes. latest version and the script. Yes, so the, the script has changed. Um, uh, it has changed, uh, since you bring it up, it has changed in two ways. So A, it does, uh, well, three ways. So um, A, it provides the, so the Pearson residual stuff now uh, for the colexeme analysis and the distinctive colexeme analysis. Because the the method now works the same for distinctive and multiple distinctive colexeme analysis. This part has been united. So there's not this strange separation in methods anymore that was in there before. And then the last thing is that um, I now, I still provide the fisher yates test, you know, although I'm not necessarily encouraging it, but I've also now fully integrated the computation of it that avoids the inf or the zero problem. So um, basically now the test, it, it will try the old test, the old fisher yates test. If that works, it'll give you that. If it doesn't work, it'll adopt a different strategy and will compute a new value. So this inf infinity problem that many people have had over the last 20 years, you know, um, that's gone now. Uh, so those are the new, uh, the main new changes in, in the script. Okay. Okay. Um, Recently in NLP, there's word vectors. So can word vectors or word embeddings be used in such color structure analyses? <laughs> um, uh, I mean, the short answer is yes, um, they, they can. Uh, the, but it's not. I mean, it's not yet straightforward. So I've done, I mean, basically like if you if you add constructional annotation to a corpus so that it's in there like as like it would be in a word, yeah, like, it, like it would be a word, you know, then of course you can run, um, you can run a glove or word to vec or something like that uh, on such an annotated corpus. Um, and basically you can ask for all the words that are most similar to the word you insert it because it means a construction, right? And so then if those get sorted by cosines or, or whatever, you know, then of course you will get uh, you will get a result that is similar to a color structure analysis. Uh, the problem for this, uh, or one problem for this could be though, that, um, I mean, these, these algorithms are very powerful. Uh, and I mean, I've used them in a variety of different contexts, both in theoretical and in applied contexts. But um, if you wanna use them for constructional stuff, then um, unless the constructions you're looking at are things that you can easily automatically find, you know, then it will be difficult to come up with, um, uh, with a big enough corpus with all those construction examples in there, right? Because the thing is, if you, uh, I mean, in order to do what I just said, you need to train a word to vec or a glove model or something like this, you know, or, or uh, BERT or whatever, you know, 
you, you need to train that on, on a big enough corpus so that there's enough data for this complicated model to detect the right kind of structure in them, right? So I, I haven't tried it. Uh, it would be an interesting case study, actually. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, like, if you take the ISGB corpus, you know, there it's super simple to work with ditransitives because that's actually already in the annotation. Right, so so it would take me like ten minutes to write a script that basically adds, you know, ditransitive annotation to the whole corpus and then train a model on this. But the thing is, I wouldn't be surprised if the one million words it contains is way too small. Right, and so so the answer, the short answer is, you know, theoretically, yes, it's possible. Practically, it might be difficult depending on the on the abstractness of the construction you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I was wondering whether we can add a diachronic dimension to the 3D plot to make it a 4D plot. <laughs> In other words, what do you think we could do to improve diachronic distinctive policy analysis? Um, uh, okay, so that opens up a whole bunch of issues. Um, I mean, one could do it how long talk just about that uh, so okay first i mean yes of course it's possible to add this as a dimension uh, i mean you might run into you know visual representation issues because obviously you cannot easily represent a, a fourth dimension in a plot uh, you know three is already tricky to deal with um mm -hmm. four is pretty much impossible unless we use color and symbols and other things that make it really hard to process um but you know, let's put it this way: integrating it statistically is no problem at all. Uh, interpreting that visually, <laughs> that's a different story. Um, second, uh, what do you think we could do to improve diachronic distinctive color analysis? Well, um, I mean, again, that's I mean, that's a dissertation level topic. But so, off the top of my head, you know. Um, I mean, one possibility would be to, there's, there's so many interlocking things. <laughs> yes, a lot. So one possibility would be to determine in a way that I will not talk about now, to determine in a way what time periods need to be distinguished in your diachronic corpus. Okay, let's say you have 300 or 400 years of data, um, you know, then in a way that I will not talk about now, you know, you probably need to say, okay, those are, let's say, five or six or eight or three, you know, depending on the data, at distinct time periods. Then, um, then you would do a distinctive collect seam analysis for whatever you're looking at. Um, and then in this case, it would be especially important uh, to dis to use an association measure that is not correlated with frequency. Okay, because if you use an associate, so Pearson residuals for that one would be tricky. A log odds ratio would be better. Why? Because if your association measure that you apply to the first, to the second, to the third time period, and so on, if your association measure reacts strongly to frequency then the values for words may change a lot just because they're used less because let's say a certain topic doesn't show up that often, right? So the frequency of the word goes down, but if your association measure is one that reacts more to frequency than to association, then of course you're taking away the wrong message from that, right? So in a case like this, where the time periods are likely to be different in terms of topic, in terms of size, in terms of register, you know, because of sampling issues with diachronic data, you know, that would be super important. So, you know, without launching into another 10 minutes about this question, you know, it, uh, I mean, that would be the most important thing to do. So A, you know, decide on a meaningful way to divide the time, the time that you can cover into distinct sub periods. Uh, and I've written stuff about that. You know, and then do the distinctive collect seam analysis, but use the log odds ratio or something like this so that you can then make meaningful association comparisons all the time. I think I'm going to leave it at that because otherwise it gets too far. 
Okay. Uh, is it necessary to include biospeaker as a random variable into the mixed effects models for the color structure analysis? <laughs> well, uh, is it so the color structural analysis is very burdensome because we want to add more different dimensions onto it. Well, yeah. well, but that's good, you know, because because we have a ton of studies that are relatively simple. So, mm -hmm. so in general, I you know I love the way I, I love the directions in which these questions are going. You know, it's exactly what we need to do. Now, this question is is tricky because um, because th there's two ways uh, because I don't know which of two interpretations are meant here. Okay, so. Um, so is the idea to to do a color structure analysis to you uh, to do a color structure analysis and take those values that come out of it and somehow make them a predictor in a mixed effects model? That is one kind of possible reading of that question. Okay. The other possible reading of that question is, um, or, or maybe that's just a connection I see, you know, but it is a very pertinent one. Um, you can use a mixed effects model to do a color structure analysis. Okay, and so I, I'm not sure I can answer that question because I don't know which of the two directions it wants to take. Okay, so if you know during the time that we still have this uh, this asker, you know, uh, can clarify that, I'm happy to come back to this. But right now, I don't know, you know, which of the two directions the the person here. Uh, again, I'm not going to pronounce the name. Uh, mm -hmm. wants to go okay okay so that person who asked that question at 6 22 you know she should well your time uh, whatever uh, should maybe clarify this all right next one uh will the result of color structure analysis be affected by sample size hell yes um is it meaningful to discuss attractive repel color seams that are not significant at the level of color five especially when there are few significantly attractive repel color seams um Well, so a let me say again. So with number one, so so yeah, in, in general, there will be an effect of sample size. Um, the effect of sample size will be will be noticeable on two levels. So the first the first level is dependent on the association measure that you're using. So if you are using fisher yates exact test, log likelihood. Pearson residuals, you know, the if, if you go with the exploratory stuff, um, then because all these conflate frequency and association into one measure, you know, then because they reflect frequency so much, of course, sample size will have a huge impact, right? Um, now, the second, the second effect of uh, sample size could, depends could be less pronounced because um, if I say something first, let me go back to the first one. So so the effect on the on the values, the combined frequency association will be big. Um, you know, and and it will also be big on the level of you know what can be significant on it. Right? If your corpus is really small, uh, you know, you're not gonna have as many significant results as if the corpus, you know, was exactly the same, but 10 times as big, you know, then you get a ton more significant results. So A, you know, so sample size will have an effect on frequency-based association measures and also on p-values. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the second level is that of, um, the second level where sample size has less of a detrimental effect is that of um, uh, rank ordering. Right, so uh, in part in response to uh, Jones and uh, so Joan Bybee's and um, uh, Schmidt and Küchenhoff's papers, uh, you know, I did like a very small set of simulations uh, where I manipulated the sample size and checked, you know, what effect does it have on the outcome, right? And the numerical out the numerical changes were massive, of course, right? If you make the corpus ten times as big, you know, the the p value results hugely uh, change. Uh, by many, many orders of magnitude, potentially. Okay, but 
typically no one gives a damn. You know, what people are interested in is the top ranked ones and the rankings change very little. Okay, they change a little bit, but uh, in my little simulation studies in the 2012 and 15 papers, um, the, the rank correlations for data from very differently large corpora um, were 0.8 and higher. Uh, so they were so in terms of the verbs or words that will win, you know, that will go to the top, uh, the results might not change a bit, even if the numerical values that lead to the ranking are very different. Now, the second question: is it meaningful to discuss attractive repel coloxemes that are not significant, especially when there are few significantly attractive coloxemes? Um The, the short answer is yes, I think so. Uh, and the main reason is that, I mean, most collocational studies and also then most colostructural studies actually haven't considered significance much. Uh, this might in part be due to the fact that, you know, a lot of this work has been done on languages where the corpora that were available were pretty large. And so, um, so there was always a, a huge number of significant results just because the corpus was so big, you know, so the question of what do we do with not significant results hardly ever came up because the top 50, the top 100 were all significant, right? Now, um, but that also means that I at least am not aware of a lot of work, if any, uh, that says, you know, non-significant results are not, I mean, we don't need to discuss them. Uh, uh, on the contrary, I mean, the field seems to be going in this direction that everything that has to do with p-values is suddenly bad. Uh, I don't want to go into that whole thing because that will take another 50 minutes, but um, so if anything, I think uh, a lot of readers will be very sympathetic towards or to you discussing things, even if they're not, you know, nominally speaking, significant at 0.05. Um, if, I mean, you should admit, you know, for which words the result is not normally significant, uh, nominally significant, whatever, you know, but um, if, if there is a good story to be told, meaning, you know, if they, the results can be interpreted in the proper, uh, in an insightful way, you know, yeah, you shouldn't say, oh, but now it's point of six, you know, now I'm not going to discuss this. Um, I think that would be throwing the baby out of the bathroom. All right. Uh, <clears throat> in one of your slides, surprise was mentioned. Yeah, I should have done that. I wonder whether it can be used to measure the uncertainty of the frames or not. Um, Will it effectively reflect the usage of the phrase or the flexibility of the construction? To be honest, I'm not sure I understand the question. So and that's because I don't understand what uncertainty of a phrase means. Um, Right. I mean, so the way surprisal is normally computed in, in the psycholinguistic literature is something like, you know, the negative log of a probability uh, and typically a conditional probability. Um, and so the way that is usually done again in psycholinguistic context is, you know, from one word to the next. So the conditional probability actually becomes a transitional probability. Or the way it could be done is, you know, from some context to a certain slot. Um, but I don't know um, what this, you know, measure the uncertainty of a phrase means. So on that question, I need to pass. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, then same person, second question. Uh, I think association and dispersion measures are mostly calculated based on frequency. So can we totally eliminate the frequency in these two types of things? <laughs> Pretty much, yes. So, um, I had a, let's see if the graph here works to explain that. Um, 
Right. So let me share my screen again. Yeah. Okay, so if you look at the bottom again, I mean, the person who asked this, so um, just to remind you, so the left panel here, so every every point here is a collocation, you know, uh, it's, it's speed adjectives like fast and quick and swift plus nouns, okay? And so uh, on the x-axis here, you have co-occurrence frequency. So how often does, you know, um, fast car, how often does it occur? And then that's logged. And then on the y-axis, we have an association measure of the log likelihood value that is um, very much frequency affected. And we can see that here by this, it's a curvy linear relation, yes, but it's it's a super, super strong one, right? So we can predict, uh, I mean, the, the, log, the log co-occurrence frequency predicts approximately 95% of the variability of the log likelihood values, okay? Now, the um, so the second plot was an association measure like the log odds ratio, which is pretty insensitive to overall frequency. Um, and we can see that it, uh, but it is an association measure. And people say log likelihood is an association measure. But here we see that clash that I mentioned, namely that the log odds ratio, that's a gold standard association measure, an effect size association measure it's pretty much not at all correlated with what everybody calls an association measure, namely the log likelihood value. Now here, uh, we see what goes in the direction of the question. Namely, um, here we have co-occurrence frequency, and here we have an association measure that is not affected by frequency much. And you can see that that's true because the correlation of the of frequency with an association measure that hardly covers frequency is very low, just like we would want it. Okay, so, um, and the same is true of dispersion. Uh, so that was the graph. So I showed you this graph, right, which showed that a dispersion measure that I developed um, is actually, I mean, it, it's better than many others, but it actually still has the problem that it is very highly correlated with frequency, which by now I think is not a good thing. And then I skipped over the other graph, which is this. <clears throat> so this is a version of that dispersion measure that I developed, which corrects, well, which takes frequency, the frequency effect out of the equation, so to speak. I mean, metaphorically speaking, of course, frequency is in there, you know, mathematically, but it's done in a certain way that goes too far right now um, to take that out. And the the thing to notice is this. Uh, so if you look at this graph here, if I tell you the frequency of a word is log five, uh, is the is the log is five, okay? Then you go here to five, and then you go up, and you know, oh my God, there's just very very little variability. Once I know the frequency, you can narrow down the dispersion already totally, right? And in fact, in a way that doesn't matter right now, the green line here, what it shows is that um, that more than 90% uh, ninety percent of the word types, if you know the frequency, you already know the range of the dispersion values extremely well, right? So again, just... Uh, if if you know if you don't understand anything else, just look at the fact that you know if I tell you the frequency five, there's just this tiny little bit of variability, and the dispersion values will all be super high. Now compare this to the other graph. Okay, for nearly all frequency values up until the log of fifteen, uh, you know the blue thing is the spread is the range all dispersion values are possible regardless of the frequency, right? If I now, if with this measure, the one that I developed to, to be independent of frequency, if with this measure I tell you the frequency is five, then you have no idea what the dispersion value is because it could be anything, literally anything from zero to one, right? That's because this measure has been designed, I mean, I designed it in such a way that it doesn't completely react to frequency. And so now suddenly, um, for nearly all the word types, 
frequency does not determine dispersion. Now, one thing, I know it's technical, but I have to say this. Now, you might, of course, say, well, but look at the red line. You know, there's still a correlation here. It's 0.27. It's not 0.9 anything anymore. So obviously, it's way, way less. But it's still, it's still a correlation. Uh, so isn't that still a problem? And the answer to that, and I don't have time to discuss, to defend this in detail, but just to give you, you know, like a two sentence answer. Uh, so yes, it's still a correlation, but it's a different, it's a difference because this correlation here results from this dispersion measure being computed in a way that by definition makes it extremely highly correlated with dispersion. Okay, it can't help it. You know, th there's no way the data would be, the data could be such that you don't find that correlation. In this, with this measure, Yes, there is still a correlation, but A, it's way, way, way weaker, and B, it's actually now an empirical finding. It's not by design, because the measure by design actually takes frequency out. Okay, again, I don't have time to show you the formula and whatever, you know, but uh, so the, the fact that it looks like there's still a correlation here, uh, it, it's that does not undermine my argument, because this correlation is an empirical finding, whereas the other one is a consequence by design. Okay, so um, to, to wrap this up, so yes, it's, um, it is possible to, uh, to disentangle the two. And uh, let me just see, oh, I should have stopped, okay. Um, like if you go to my website, uh, the papers, there's a, a, two, a piece of two sister publications so 2022, uh, D, D as in Daniel and E as an echo, uh, those two discuss how we do that. Okay, thank you, Professor Grice for- 20, mm -hmm. Go ahead. 2022, uh, D as a Delta and E as an echo, okay? Those are the two papers that discuss this. Okay. Um, can speaker idiosyncrasy accounted for when dealing with color structure analysis? Yes, it can, uh, with, within limits. Um, so two, uh, two comments here. And so one goes back to the question that before I couldn't answer because I didn't understand uh, the, well, the, the mixed effects modeling related question. Uh, so one is, uh, so if you do call instructions as part of a mixed effects modeling approach, then, you know, the, obviously it can be accounted for because it would just be a different random effect. Um, <clears throat> if you do, if you do a call instruction analysis using the Pearson residuals that I've shown or any other association measure that has been uh, involved, then um, it's not straightforward how to integrate individual uh, variation into that. However, the bootstrapping approach, the uncertainty quantification that I talked about briefly, uh, that one does that at least a little bit. Um, it, it may do it not in the way that you want it, uh, but it does it. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, so what the bootstrapping approach of course doesn't allow you to do is, you know, it doesn't allow you to look at a certain speaker. Uh, I mean, it, it allows you to do that, but the bootstrapping approach doesn't already do that. It doesn't already look at a specific speaker and tells you, this is what that person does. You know, that does not happen. Uh, however, um, it the bootstrapping quantifies uncertainty on the basis of speakers or files. And so it'll give you an idea of if you have an if you have a colexeme strength for a certain word in a construction, let's say, then the bootstrapping will give you an idea of how volatile this is given the individual variation in the data. Okay, so again, that may not be all that you want. You may want more, but that is one way in which this can be uh, included. Uh, and in the mixed effects modeling context, there are other ways, but you know, I do want to make sure I get to some other questions as well. Hi, Selina. I totally agree. Yeah. I'm sorry. 
Hi, uh, Professor Gress. I don't know if that's okay with you to answer two more questions. Yeah, I have time. I can I can answer. Them. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, of course. Um, all right. So uh, I totally agree with you that the unit for color structure analysis should be construction plus function form. Thanks. Some constructions may need to be manually annotated. For instance, the annotation of lexical aspects of the best of words. Do you have any suggestion concerning such kind of construction? Um, concerning such kinds of construction, which may involve a great amount of annotation, do you have any suggestion to speed up this annotation process? Oh. Uh, nothing meaningful, no. I mean, annotation, I mean, manual annotation, I mean, for a corpus linguist, you know, that is always the bottleneck. Uh, Right. I mean, there are, uh, and I and you know, my my uh, a polemic answer I have to this question is, you know, um, it's kind of mean, but uh, you know, if you don't, <laughs> if you don't like, you know, research that involves annotation, then you can't be a corpus linguist, you know, because yes, a lot of things can be automated in some ways, you know, of course, and you know, more and more resources are becoming available. But for certain things, you know, annotation is just something, uh, manual annotation is just something that needs to be done. Uh, there's not a lot of way around this, um, simply because a lot of computational shortcuts or other kinds of, you know, lookup procedures from databases and stuff like that, they will typically, I mean, oftentimes they will come with a degree of accuracy that sounds pretty damn awesome from a computational perspective. Uh, and and it sounds pretty crappy from a theoretical corpus linguistic perspective, right? I mean, if a computational linguist tells you, uh, you know, I, I'm developing this natural language processing system and it gets the census right 85% of the time, I mean, that's awesome, right? At the same time, it means if you rely on it, you know, 15% of your annotation will be wrong. That's one out of six, mm -hmm. right? So, so no, there's no... <laughs> Uh, I mean, I don't see a lot of ways in which this could be sped up, especially, you know, if it's semantic <laughs> annotation or some kind of discourse functional annotation. Now, uh, just maybe one last thing on that. So there are some people who are now exploring the use of, you know, word to vec models and things like that to help with this. Um, and, I, and I think there is potential in that. If, if again, you know, the corpora are large enough, if they are homogeneous enough so that these models can, can detect the right kind of structure in there. Um, but also, you know, you need to, you need to remember um, that even that co collocational studies, even human co collocation studies and, and these kinds of models, you know, come with problems, uh, okay? So for example, um, I, I did some uh, corpus linguistics and the law kind of you know legal interpretation work uh, using collocational data and so and so we found uh, and so the question was you know what's the prototypical vehicle right so vehicle is a term that is used in laws and statutes and whatever and so at for a specific purpose now it doesn't matter what that was you know the question was you know what is a typical vehicle and so some people approach this with a collocational kind of approach so what kind of words are around you know vehicle just like a word to vec model would. Um, and the, uh, the the interesting thing was that, you know, sometimes you will find, uh, so some collocations of vehicle that you find, they are there because they point to something that is prototypical of a, of a vehicle, right? So for example, um, uh, you know, you, you'll find the word car around the word vehicle a lot because, you know, a car is a prototypical vehicle, for instance, right? Uh, you will find the word engine or something like that, or motor around the word vehicle because, well, most prototypical vehicles like cars, you know, have that. Uh, at the same time, um, <clears throat> this doesn't always work predictably because uh, what you don't find uh, so everybody would agree that a car is a prototypical vehicle, right? I think everybody agrees that, you know, 99.999% of all cars have wheels or tires, but you don't find these words around vehicle, right? So 
it's it's something that's prototypically there, but the corpus doesn't reflect it. So so you can't assume, you know, if it's a collocate, if it's a collocate, it's important to the prototype. If it's not, it's not. You know, that relationship will not hold. Uh, second way in which this uh, logic, the simple machine learning logic fails is um, <clears throat> if you look at the collocates of vehicle in COCA, I think we looked at, uh, or COHA of the six, of the 60s um, because of what we were trying to do. Um, no, it was more modern, right? You find the word electric a lot, right? Because, well, now electric vehicles are the whole big thing. But electric vehicles, I dare predict, I dare say, is probably still not the prototype of a vehicle, right? The prototype of a, of a car as a vehicle still has an internal combustion engine, even just by frequency. You know, electric vehicles in California even just are just 6% of all vehicles or something like that, right? So again, it doesn't hold that, you know, what you find in the corpus will be indicative of the prototype. And if not, if not, because electric is in there, but that's not the prototype. So if people say, you know, this kind of uh, like semantic annotation will be, you know, will be all taken over by word to vec and stuff. Yeah, I don't think so. So no, I don't have good suggestions for speeding this up other than, you know, throw a buttload of manpower in it. Yes, I agree. I think uh, it's uh, a you... shortcut. There is no shortcut in annotation period or the annotation process because it, it is a laborious process. Yes, yes, for sure. <clears throat> okay, for your log frequencies, why do you use two as the base, not 10? Is it the unmarked choice for log translation? Um, so actually, I think the unmarked choice for log transformation is neither two nor 10, uh, it's E. Uh, so 2.7, 1A, 2A, 1A. Um, the reason I use, uh, but so two things. So A, it actually doesn't matter which log you take because any log, is mathematically transformable into any other log. So th that means actually, if you plot, you know, something against the log of something else, you know, then the graph is not going to change if you change this from log two to log ten, right? I mean, yeah, the numbers will change, but you know, if you plot the same data, R will make the plot as wide as it needs to be, and it's actually going to look pretty much exactly the same. The only thing that will change is the numbers. So the, the choice of the log only has something to do with scaling. Now, that being said, why do I use two and not 10? Um, I basically use two because um, for two reasons. So A, uh, it's, 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 more, it's more fine grained than 10, <laughs> okay? So if you give, uh, so if the, scale, if the scale is logged and it's one, two, three, four, five here, you know, and it's a log base of two, then you, you cover, you know, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. So you cover more different values with easy to identify numbers than if you have a log 10, which is, you know, one, two, and then you're already at 100. Uh, second, I use two because um, uh, in some other contexts, I do a lot of work involving information theoretical measures. And there, a lot of times the log is uh, to the base of two because then, um, the output of such a log transformation is bits, zero, one, yes, no, right? So that's the only reason why I do this. <clears throat> okay, thank yes. you, Professor, uh, Professor Grace. I think it's almost time. Thank you very much for answering so many questions and a clarification. So no one, more <laughs> one more time, thank you for your wonderful lecture and your contribution to cognitive semantics. And here, I also want to thank all the audience who stick with us till the end. And we encourage you to continue to follow and support this series of lectures. Join our talks, ask questions, and promote this series among your colleagues. So Professor Gress, let's call it a day. Enjoy your dinner and have a Enjoy great day. Oh. I will. Thank you very much. I will, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you bye. next time. <laughs>